Uh, John has uh, presented at OLLI over the last several years. Uh, one of his popular classes is this one, Maximizing Your Social Security Benefit. John has also uh, done a class uh, on financial planning uh, at different times. He's a, a certified financial planner. And uh, in terms of his professional background, in addition to being a certified financial planner, he is a retirement income certified professional, uh, an IRS enrolled agent, and has over 21 years experience in the financial advisory industry. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Finance from Cal State Fullerton's uh, Mahalo School of Business and completed his financial planning and training from New York University and UCLA. Currently is working toward a master's in taxation from Cal State Northridge's Nazarian College of Business and Economics. John is very active in spearheading community outreach initiatives with local college, public libraries, and Southern California lifelong learning centers like our OLLI program here. And he's trying to promote financial literacy and empowerment through workshops and seminars. He has been hired as a corporate financial trainer for a number of Southern California companies. He is the founder of Odium Advisory Group, a fee-only fiduciary financial planning firm based in Los Angeles with offices in Long Beach and Brea. Please welcome John Pack. All right, let's get started. Thank you, Russ. And as always, thank you uh, to the rest of the Ollie staff members for making this happen, uh, especially during the uh, during this pandemic. Um, it's uh, some wild times, some wild times we're having. But um, welcome to the seventh annual Social Security Benefit Maximization Workshop. Uh, as Russ mentioned, my name is John Pack, and I will be your instructor this morning. Uh, for the next hour and a half or so, I'm going to focus on a very important income source that usually gets overlooked. Um, I'm not surprised, you know, it's not as it's not as sexy or exciting as the uh, as the stock market, right? But I'm hoping this presentation will change how you perceive social security, social security income. Um, I'll start by going over some foundational concepts you should be comfortable with, and then I'll share the top 10 tips on how to apply these theories into practice. And by the end, I'm hoping you will take away one or two concepts that you can personally apply immediately. Ready to get started? Okay, I'm going to move on. So just a quick disclaimer, um, without reading this verbatim, I just want you all to understand that I'm not here to uh, have you memorize formulas or rules or numbers. I just want all of you to get a, a good grasp of the concepts. What is John trying to tell me? Now, keep in mind that all of these um, concepts that I'm about to show you in the next hour to an hour and a half may not all pertain to you. So try to pick and choose the ones that do. And, and again, I'll, I'll stick around for Q&A but if one is uh, perhaps a little confusing, again, please feel free to stop me at any point and I would love to uh, clarify, okay? As I said, what a year it's been. Jeez, um, from the COVID-19 pandemic to global protests for equality and, and elections 30 some odd days away, be still my heart. <laughs> However, Social Security has made headlines a few times this year as well. Let me share a few. So if you take a look at the slide up here, uh, you'll notice that the payroll ceiling has increased to 137,700. Uh, COLA, the cost of living adjustment, rose to 1.6%. The quarterly coverage for credits and we'll, we'll deep, go into a deep dive of all of these items. So uh, if none of these make sense to you at the moment, it's okay, it's gonna make sense. Uh, the average benefit of 1422 rose to 1461 and the earnings test 
increase to 18,240 per year. Okay, those are some of the uh, updates for 2020. Now, I want to, as I mentioned earlier, I want to start with uh, just a little bit of the foundational piece. Um, perhaps many of you may already know this, but you know, I'm just going to assume that if I could cater to the common denominator, most of us may not know this. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'll start with the basics. Now, Social Security is made up of four departments. Take a look at the top left hand corner. You got a couple of acronyms. You got the OAS, which stands for the Old Age and Survivors Department. You got DI, which stands for Disability. You have HI, which stands for Hospital Insurance, otherwise known as Medicare Part A. And then the fourth department, you have Supplementary Medical Insurance, also known as Medicare Part B. However, for this morning, uh, we will focus on the Old Age and Survivors Department. Now, for those of you who are still working, uh, you may recall seeing the acronyms FICA, pronounced FICA. It stands for the Federal Insurance Contributory Act, also known as the payroll taxes. FICA taxes covers both Social Security and Medicare. Now, it's deducted from each paycheck, as you may have noticed. And as you work and pay these FICA taxes, you earn credits that go towards your social security records. So follow along with me on this uh, on the slide here. So if you follow the red ball here, as an employee, you'll notice 6.2% of your salary uh, being deducted per pay, per pay period, alongside with 1.45% of Medicare. So again, 6.2% of your earnings go uh, go into the social security pot and 1.45% go into the Medicare pot. Now let's take a look at the opposite side of the screen. You'll notice that employers actually match the 6.2% and place it into your pot as well as the 1.45 for Medicare. Now, if you were self-employed, you would actually be considered both the employee as well as the employer. So you would just double the 6.2 to 12.4, okay? As well as the Medicare from 1.45 to 2.9. So the deductions all go into this pot we call Social Security Trust Fund, okay? Now this trust fund, believe it or not, is what we call the pay-as-you-go system. So as, as quickly as the money goes in, it quickly goes out and pays out to the, um, to the eligible beneficiaries out there. Now, if you really dig into it, you'll notice that about 85 cents for every social security dollar goes towards the old age and survivors department. And about 15 cents of that same dollar goes into the disability department. Now, if there's ever a surplus, you'll notice that it goes right into uh, another pot. Uh, there are many nomenclatures for it, but for now, we'll just call it a separate account, okay? And when there's money coming into the account versus, let's say there's more money coming into the account versus what it needs to pay out, the excess contributions are invested in a special US non-marketable securities, usually uh, bonds, or uh, some kind of a fixed uh, interest vehicle. Okay, so this is just another illustration for, for those who, uh, let's say, uh, have been uh, out of the job force for, you, for a number of years. Um, if you look at a typical uh, paycheck stub, you'll notice on the right-hand side, it's, it denotes FICA for Medicare and FICA for Social Security. And if you do the math, that exact percentage should be 6.2% of your earnings for that pay period, alongside with 1.45, okay? Now, I wanna mention something here really quick. Um, I'll probably get to it uh, down the line, but just in case I don't. You'll, if you remember the previous slide, I mentioned that there was a, um, a wage limit. Let me quickly go back here. 
of 137,700. What that basically means is that this 6.2% gets capped at 137,700. So for those who are making, say, 137, let's just say 138,000, at that point, your employer will stop deducting payroll taxes for Social Security. However, for Medicare, there is no cap. Okay, you can make a million dollars and they'll still take 1.45%. So now that we kind of know how so the Social Security system works, how do we join the club? You need to earn and accumulate 40 credits as a minimum requirement. Now, it doesn't mean you should stop at 40 credits. It means you need 40 credits to be considered for benefits. Now, remember one credit equals $1,410. And this number tends to change on an annual basis. So in the year 2020, remember it's 1410. So if you earn one credit equaling 1410, do you stop there? Actually, you get to max out at four credits per year. So four credits times 1410 equals 5,640. Okay. So again, you need to earn a wage of at least 5,400 or actually 5,640 to satisfy the full four credits. Let's just say, for example, if you work part-time, let's say as a pizza delivery guy or gal, earning $13 an hour, I believe that might be the minimum wage these days, and you earn $6,000 for the year, you have satisfied the four credits. Okay, now that I got my foot into the door, how can I secure the best possible shot at maximizing my benefits? So Social Security calculates this thing called the average, uh, let me see if I can find that for you. Here it is, the average indexed monthly earnings, the average index monthly earnings. That's a very important term to get familiar with. And they plug in your total wages into these separate formulas. Now, this is based, let me see if I could show you another version of this. Okay, I thought I might have had it. But if there's anything to take away from this slide, take a look at the, uh, the bolded letters. Okay, so for example, number one, your highest 35 years of earnings. Okay, that were subject to FICA taxes. So again, it goes back to whatever your ceiling or wage limit was for that particular year. Okay, and then you multiply by the index factor that's assigned for each year. Okay, that helps for inflation purposes. The second factor you want to remember is 420. That's just another way of looking at 35 years times 12 months, 420. Okay. And the third factor you want to keep in mind is the assigning, the assignment of bend points. I know all of this sounds like, <laughs> like you're reading hieroglyphics, but just stick with me. So this is something you could actually find uh, through some of the publications that are released by the IRS. Um, this is just a sample. I know it says 2016. They do have the most recent um, uh, tables for, for this year. But as you can see, you have your max wage limits right here on this, uh, on this column. And then what you do is you look at your earnings for, let's say you started working in 1982. Then you start plugging in your actual earnings. Now remember, you don't want to exceed your limit, the wage limit, right? So if you made uh, 31,000 for 1982, you put in 31,000. But if you made 35,000 in 1982, you want to cap it at 32,400, okay? So you add the actual earnings, you multiply it by the index, index factor, and you get the indexed earnings. So when it's time for you to actually do the calculation, you take all of your indexed earnings, hopefully 35 years worth, and then you get this total. This is just an example. 
So you get this whopping huge number. So you take that number and you divide it by 420. If you remember the three factors that I just discussed. Once you make the division, you get another number. And this is where the bend points come in. You take the first 90% of this number, excuse me, the first 90% of 960, excuse me. And that, get, that turns out to be 864. Once you subtract the 10,386 from 960, you'll get a number probably that exceeds 5785, but you do not want to exceed that number. So uh, whatever number is in between, you multiply by 32, you get that number. Anything over 15%, you add that number. And once you do the addition, you get something called a PIA. Clear as mud. <laughs> so what I really want you to take away from all this is all these calculations that I'm showing you, I, I just want to overemphasize, you do not have to do. If you go to ssa.gov, they have some wonderful calculators that save you tons of time. All you need is one of those uh, social security statements that you get on an annual basis, hopefully, um, and they will tell you what to plug into the calculator. But if I had to take away, uh, let's just say one concept based on all the, the calculations and numbers I just showed you, attempt to work for 35 years. That's tip number one for you. Maximization tip number one, attempt to work for 35 years or more. Now going through some of these um, factors, as I mentioned, you'll notice that the, the number 35 comes out a few times. That's how important it is to maximizing your benefits. Okay, I'm gonna add one more thought. So if you work longer for 35 years, which I completely condone as a financial planner, if you can, the Social Security Administration will use your highest 35 years and you do not understand how important that is until you're actually in that situation. Because you got to remember when you started working, again, I'm just using this as an example, uh, let's say back in the 80s, or let's just say maybe even the 90s, um, your wage perhaps might not have been as high as the wages that you were earning in the 2000s. So what happens is as you continue to exceed that 35 year mark, the higher earning years will basically replace the lower earning years of the 80s. And again, once you plug in the higher numbers into the formula, you can imagine your benefit amount increases. Now, conversely, if you work less than 35 years, what they're going to do is they're going to average in zeros for the years that you were lacking. Now, we don't have to be mathematicians to figure out if we start adding in zeros, it's going to start dragging down your average. Okay, so you got to watch out for that. So one more time, the bare minimum to qualify is 40 credits, four credit maximums per year, and that'll allow you to slip through the velvet ropes. Now, if you don't remember a single concept that I talk about today, <laughs> please, pay, please pay attention to this one. Okay. Knowing the simple acronym will, will allow you to raise your chances of maximizing your benefits. The acronym here, let me start with the first one, is PIA, also known as your primary insurance amount. That's just another way of expressing your monthly benefit. Okay, your monthly benefit. Your FRA is equally important to know. It represents your full retirement age. Now, if you look into the definition, I'll sum it up really basically like this. Your FRA represents the age in which you will receive 100% of your benefits that you have earned. Again, it's worth repeating. It is the, it is the age in which you will receive 100% of the benefits you have earned. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the first thing that comes into your mind after saying what I just said was, okay, so John, 
if I apply at different points, let's say for example, I don't know my full retirement age and I happen to have applied before the full retirement age, does that mean it's going to affect my PIA? Absolutely. You will get less than 100% of what you're owed. Okay, so next step is how do you determine what your full retirement age is? Now, uh, speaking on behalf of myself, I was born in the 70s. So I automatically know that my full retirement age is 67. Okay, now, um, majority of my clients who are, uh, who are older, uh, they, they fall into the middle category between 43 and 54. So their full retirement age is 66. And anyone prior to 37 would be 65. Okay. Now your next question for those who spotted this, what if I was born in 1956? Is my full retirement age 66? Or is it 67? Do I flip a coin? What do I do? Well, if you, if you look at the publications that are released by the IRS, it's not the IRS, but the Social Security Administration, they'll give you a chart that gives you the specific age that are in between these whole numbers of 66 and 67. So for example, if you were born in 1955, your full retirement age is 66 plus two months. If you were born in 1956, it's 66 plus four months. So as you continue going up the ladder up to 1960, you'll notice that it increases by two months each year. Okay. So if I can uh, make a quick request, please jot down your full retirement age, circle it, memorize it, know it backwards and forwards. That is your full retirement age. So as I alluded to earlier, what happens if I need the benefits before my full retirement age? Well, this slide shows you what happens. If I could again, uh, have you all glance your eyes towards this area where I'm uh, taking the, uh, <laughs> the red ball here. At 62, we call that a premature um, distribution, a premature distribution. And when that happens is you get a pay cut of 25%. You get a pay cut of 25%. So if your full retirement age at 66 would have yielded a payment of 1,000, now you're getting shortchanged by $250. That's a lot if you add it up on a monthly basis. Again, on the flip side, if you are one of the fortunate ones who can delay the distribution, or uh, let's just say you're still working, for example, and you don't need the benefits at this time, then you can also wait until the age of 70 and look what happens. Instead of getting a pay cut, you get a pay raise of 32%. So instead of getting $1,000 at your full retirement age, now you're looking at a pay raise of an extra $320 on a monthly basis. Again, face value, it might not look like a lot, but I'm telling you, it adds up. It adds up. Imagine adding cost of living adjustments to this, you're not getting 1320 at all times. You're also getting incremental increases. Now I understand that not everyone enjoys fractions. <laughs> so let me do the math for you. If you need the income sooner than your full retirement age, understand that your benefits will be reduced based on this particular formula that the uh, that SSA applies. So quickly doing the math, if you were looking at a reduction, let's say uh, three years, that's 36 months, three years prior to your full retirement age, that equation turns out to a 20% reduction. 
Now, if you are, say, applying at 62, it's not just three years before your full retirement age, right? Because your full retirement age is 66. It's actually four years. So they bring in another fractional or formula that is a fraction <laughs> um, where they take 12 months and they multiply by five twelves. So if you add the two formulas together at the age of 62, this is how they get a reduction of 25%. Just for those who are curious as to how uh, the 25 percent number came about. Okay, so as I said on the flip side, if you can, uh, for you know, I'm sure there are going to be folks who need the money early, but there are also a handful of folks who can wait. So if you take a look at the impact of, uh, let's say, taking your distributions at a later time, you get something called a delayed retirement credit. Delayed retirement credit. It, it's just uh, another way of saying we will raise your payment 8% per year, possibly for four years. So quickly do the math in your head with me. If you waited until 70, that means you got 68, yeah, excuse me, 67, 68, 69, and 70. That's four years. So four times 8% for those who are born after, four, let's just say, 43 or later, you get an 8% pay raise per year for four years. And that's how we get 32, four times 8, 32. Okay, just to show you how we got that number. Now, here's a cheat sheet for those who uh, don't want to do any of the math. <laughs> you just want to know, hey, if I take it early, what percentage of my full retirement payment do I get? If I take it later, what does that turn out to be? So you just take that percentage and you multiply it by your full retirement payment. Okay, that's how you do it. And it's just a graphical depiction. Okay, so let's run into tip number two. Let's say you were in a position where you filed early, uh, which I, I do not blame most people, especially during this pandemic, um, with the layoffs or with, let's say, uh, the reduced hours. Um, you know, we're just looking for that extra little, little bit to keep us afloat. So say you filed early. But then within six months, you get a call from one of the employers that, uh, that you always wanted to work for. And they said, you know what? Hey, we got an opening. Come on over, we want you. Then what you can actually do is you can apply for something called a do-over, a do-over. Now, what that means is you could actually fill out a form that says, you know what? Um, I've been receiving payments for the last six months and I just want to pay it back. I want to pay it back because I don't need it anymore. So the moment you pay it back, there's no interest accruing, by the way, um, it'll appear on the system as if you never applied before. And if you've never applied before, that means now you can go through the uh, the tips I just shared with you, the, the later you take your distributions, the more money you get. Okay. Now, here's a quick caveat, though, a little warning for you. You have to make this decision to apply for a do-over within 12 months. If it happens to be 12 months and a day, they will decline or not approve your application. They meaning the Social Security Administration. Oh, here's another one. This is tip number three. Let's say you started collecting at the age of 62 and now you have hit your full retirement age. You can actually apply for something called the start, stop, start. Start, stop, start. So what that basically means is the moment you hit say 66, you contact Social Security and you say, um, Social Security, I would like to 
voluntarily suspend my payments moving forward. At that point, once you fill out the necessary and proper forms, they will stop sending you your benefits. And what happens at that point is from, again, remember from 66 to 70, they give you a pay raise. So while you have your payment suspended in, you know, behind the curtain or under the hood, you you will notice that there's an 8% uh, addition that's being applied on an annual basis for four years or for how many, you know, let's say number of years that you would like to delay it. Doesn't have to be 70, it could be 68. Then you just take the 8% and multiply it by two. That should be 16. Okay, so this is an interesting concept. Now, when you, when you claim social security benefits before you reach your full retirement age and you continue working and earnings that you receive, the earnings that you receive are above a certain threshold, then you are subject to something called the retirement earnings test, a retirement earnings test. This retirement earnings test reduces your benefits before you reach your full retirement age. So let me, let me give you an example. Um, again, if you could follow the red ball here. Let's say that you earned $20,240 per year. $20,240 a year. And I'm not talking about your social security benefits. I'm just talking about your wages that you get from your employment. Then what happens is you'll notice that the difference between $20,240 and $18,240 is $2,000. You take the $2,000 and you divide it by half. You divide it by half. So 2,000 divided by half is 1,000. So let me ask you, is the $1,000 being applied towards your monthly benefits? Say your monthly benefits from Social Security is 1,000. That means are you getting $0 moving forward? No, it's actually $1,000 that gets subtracted from your annual benefit amount. So let me start over. You're getting $20,240, let's say W, we call it W-2 wages, but you're also getting, say, $12,000 from Social Security benefits. Then what happens is once you apply this formula, instead of getting $12,000 on an annual basis from Social Security, you're now getting $11,000. Okay, hopefully that, that makes sense. And this earnings test will continue to follow you, as I said, until you hit your full retirement age. Or let's, just, let's say that you just stopped working. But this formula comes to play when you are, number one, receiving Social Security benefits, and number two, earning W-2 wages at the same time, okay? Now you're probably looking at the bottom column here and you're saying, hey, wait a second, John, what is this? Well, there's another special calculation that comes to pass when you are say uh, 12 months or less, or let's just say 12 months or fewer away from hitting your full retirement age. Um, let's just say you're 65 and six months. So you're literally six months away from your full retirement age. Then Social Security will still look at your W-2 wages that year. And they'll say, well, you know, I'm noticing that you have earned, let's say, $68,600. Then you take the difference between $68,600 and the $48,600, which happens to be, again, $20,000. Uh, let's say divided by, well, that's, let's, make, <laughs> let's make the number easy for everyone. Let's say it happens to be 78,600. So if you take the difference, that's 30,000. 
So the 30,000 divided by three is again 10,000. So they will still take that reduction of 10,000 and subtract it from your annual amount until you turn full retirement age. Okay. Now you're thinking to yourself, wait, you know, that, that kind of sucks. <laughs> I want that deduction back. And here's the good news. You actually do get it back. The retirement earnings test reduces, yes, it does reduce your benefits before you, you reach full retirement age. But the good news is the moment you hit your full retirement age, you actually get the deductions back. The money that was lost isn't really lost. Once you hit that FRA, Social Security will actually look at your deductions that you went through from, say, 62 to 66, and they'll actually give it back to you. They'll have their own little formula. Now, I'm sure you all probably knew this the moment I opened my mouth, but they're not going to give you the full deduction right away. So if they took $20,000 from you from that period from 62 to 66, they're probably, not probably, they will give back the amount in increments. Again, there's a formula for this. So it could be literally 20 some odd dollars that they tack on to your benefits. Now, depending upon how long you live, you may get everything back or you may not. But again, the, the good news is it's being given back to you. Okay, so how are benefits taxed? Now, contrary to popular belief, you may think that your social security benefits uh, came from paying taxes while you were working. So surely you can't be taxed again, right? The answer unfortunately is wrong. You, you will be taxed on your social security benefits. Uh, and if you have substantial income where you are combining your social security benefits with, let's say your wages, or perhaps with, uh, you know, some people might still have a pension account or some people might be taking uh, 401k distributions, then uh, you will definitely see taxation. Okay. So let's go with this first stage. Uh, it's a two part stage of, um, of, uh, of calculations. Okay. So if you take a look again, this red ball, if you follow along with me, you have your adjusted gross income plus your non-taxable interest for those who are receiving muni bond income, say, for example. Then you add your annual Social Security benefits amount. So you add all three categories if it pertains to you, and then you get your provisional income. You get your provisional income. So let's, uh, let's quickly go through an example. Let's say your adjusted gross income happens to be $20,000. Uh, you are married, filing joint, there is no muni bonds, and your annual Social Security benefits happens to be, say, 12000 So you add 20000 plus 12000 equals thirty-two. Is that correct? What do you all think? If you can catch my mistake, please write it in the chat box. Or please feel free to unmute yourself. Did I do the math right? 20,000 plus 12,000 of my full annual Social Security benefits equals 32,000 of provisional income. Okay, Floyd, I appreciate that. So, what Floyd mentioned was you gotta divide by two. So technically, what you have to do is you have to add 20,000 of your gross income, adjusted gross, plus 6,000, not for the full annual $12,000 benefit, but a half, one half of your annual benefits. So it's 6,000. Very good catch, Floyd. So 20 plus 6 equals 26,000. Now you take that amount and you apply that to this chart. So remember my, my, uh, uh, the example I was using, your married filing joint, 
and your provisional income happens to be 26,000. So anything below 32,000, take a look at this. You're actually getting zero taxation. Zero taxation, yes, you are seeing correctly. Now, anything between 32, let's say you exceeded 32, anything between 32 and 44, you're paying about half a percent of Social Security taxes. Anything above 44, you're looking at 85%. Now, I'm going to give you another quick pop quiz here. So if my taxes are going to be taxed at 85%, does that mean that $12,000 of my annual Social Security benefits will be taxed at the rate of 85%? Okay, well, uh, I will take the silence as you do not know. Um, <laughs> so the 85% is not, in fact, your tax rate. It just means, now take a look at the, the left-hand side. It says it's the portion or the amount that is taxed. So 85% of your $12,000 will be taxed at your personal tax rate. So for example, let's say you go to your tax guy or gal and they say uh, your joint filing yielded a tax, a personal tax rate of say 15%. Then what happens is they take that 15% tax rate and they apply that towards 85% of your annual benefits. That's how it works. Um, looks like Yolanda also uh, added a question here. 85% uh, of your full Social Security or one half would be taxed? No, it's 85% of your full annual Social Security benefits will be taxed by your personal tax rate of whatever it is, 15%, 20%, all the way up to 37%. So COLA, the cost of living adjustment, is tied closely to inflation, which is determined. Uh, now, I'm not an economist, and I don't want to bore you with all these econ terminologies. But the takeaway is uh, there is a formula that Social Security uses. Um, and it's a basket that they take into consideration, like food and energy. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't really take into account some of the factors that uh, our senior citizens really, uh, really find important to be included into the cost of living adjustment, like housing and, and, and uh, you know, let's say uh, topics like Medicare or medical expenses. Um, but removing myself from the details of the calculation, I just want everyone to understand that there's a cost of living adjustment that gets added to your benefits on an annual basis. Now, will it always be 1.6? Absolutely not. Sometimes it's two. Historically, it's been uh, a little over two, slightly under three. Um, but I've also seen years where Social Security uh, gave out zero. And uh, for those who may recall, it was back in the 2008-2009 uh, the financial debacle. But what I want you to take away from this slide is, I, I want you to understand that this is a very, very important source of income for all of us, in, including myself. I, and there's still talks of Social Security, um, you know, just collapsing by the time I'm in retirement. But again, putting full faith into the system, you'll notice that if you look at all your available assets that can actually generate income. Now, let's say excluding for those who are eligible for a pension, this is a source of income that will continue for the rest of your life. And then some, meaning for those who are married or for those who have kids under, under 16, it could continue being paid out, okay? So please do not push this to the back of the line. Consider this just as important as your other retirement accounts. As a retirement income specialist, I look at every single account that my clients have. And again, 
right alongside with the pensions and the 401ks and the 403bs and the IRAs, social security is on the same level, at least in my book. And when you're putting together income plans or income distribution plans, um, social security is always top of mind for me. Because the more social security income that you have, that you can rely on, you don't have to take as much from your retirement accounts and you could allow that to grow. If you could all uh, understand that concept really quick. Here's another cheat sheet for you. And folks, uh, Russ mentioned that the, uh, the slides as well as the presentation will be available for all to see, but this is another cheat sheet. So for example, it gives you a just a quick percentage of, let's say, various scenarios. If you had, say, uh, a spouse who hit full retirement age, and let's say whoever the higher earner was, uh, was going through, let's say, distributions of 100% of his or her benefits, the spouse will also receive 50%. However, take a look at the bottom, uh, bottom row. If you are under your full retirement age, look what happens. You're not getting the full 50%. You're actually getting 32.5. Okay, so you have to watch out for the, for the ages. Here's another tip. There is no incentive. There's no reason to wait past your full retirement age if you are looking for spousal benefits. If you're looking for spousal benefits, again, do not wait past your full retirement age because there is no extra little pay raises. There, there isn't, okay? So take it at, at your the first window of opportunity, which is your full retirement age. And here's another trick. If you are able to take that spousal benefits at your full retirement age, it gives you license to postpone your own. And by postponing your own benefits, and uh, again, uh, assuming that the delayed retirement credits of 8% can actually help, it might act you might end up with a higher benefit uh, at the age of 70. If that is the case, you would, you would much rather take your own benefits as opposed to spousal. And remember, you can never take both. You always take the higher of the two. Here is a, um, a tricky one to follow, but if you can, try your best. So spousal benefits uh, apply before you are at your full retirement age will cause your benefits to be reduced. Okay. Now, what that means, let, let me give you an example. Maybe this might help. Let's say that your, um, again, I, let's, you know, let's say the wife, let's say the wife was earning, um, or about to earn $2,000 of social security benefits at her full retirement age. And the spouse, the husband, uh, let's say their full retirement age benefits would have been say, oh, I don't know, let's just make it an easy number. Um, let's say 500, okay? Or you know, let's make it a thousand, let's make it a thousand. So you got the wife, at full retirement age is 2,000, and the husband who uh, is about to receive 1,000. So the husband is looking at this in the sense that, you know what, I'm going to wait until my wife gets her delayed retirement credits at the age of 70, and then, you know, any time between, you know, let's say he was uh, 65. The moment he hit 66, he's thinking, I'm gonna get half of her increased retirement benefits. But the way that this works is, when you file for spousal benefits at that age, remember, we're talking about 65 here, um, you will be deemed as applying for both spousal benefits and your own. So the way that this works is, 
instead of actually getting half of your wife's benefits, which, which grew quite substantially, you're actually looking at uh, either your same benefits or even lower. I know this is super confusing. I wish I had a, a, a blackboard to, to show you how the math works. But for now, just understand that if you apply for spousal benefits under your full retirement age, it causes your benefits to be reduced. Just remember that for now. And hopefully I can maybe clarify that. Uh, maybe another, I think there might be another slide here coming up. Oh, actually here is a continuation of what I was talking about. If you're eligible for benefits for both as a retired worker and as a spouse before the age of your full retirement age, you must apply for both and you will receive the higher of the two. And if you look on the, the second bullet point, it's called deeming because when you apply for one benefit, you are deemed to have also applied for the other. I wanna see if I could do a quick uh, drawing here. It's probably not gonna be as clean. So let's say that uh, the benefit amount for the higher earner was 2000, okay? And let's say the, uh, the other spouse, who was, let's say, the lower earning wage um, earner had a um, amount of, let's say, a thousand. Okay. Try to think if that's the best way to explain this. Uh, maybe if, okay. So I'm hoping everyone follows this so far. So what happens is, the spouse at the age of six, I don't know, again, I'm going to use a number that's before the full retirement age. Let's just say uh, 62. What happens is there's a formula that Social Security uses where they take 2,000 divided by two, okay, that's 1,000, and they subtract out 100% of, let's say, the spouse's full retirement benefit which instead of being 500, which was reduced from the, which was reduced because there were 62. So this happens to be your spousal benefit. Please tell me if you see this calculation. And if this calculation does not make sense, I can certainly take uh, some time either after the presentation or take a, uh, a phone call um, after the presentation, either way, whichever you feel. But again, this is a very important concept to, to understand. So let's take a look yeah. at the, uh, the next slide. It's uh, your voluntary suspension. I mentioned that terminology earlier. Now, what does that mean? It means that you're voluntarily suspending your benefits at your full retirement age in order to earn higher benefits for delaying. But during the voluntary suspension, the benefits to your spouse will also be suspended and that's a huge red flag for those who did not know how this voluntary suspension works. So the moment, let's again, using that same example of the higher wage earner, if they wanted to wait and suspend their benefits to get the delayed retirement credits, um, you're essentially suspending your spouse's ability to file as well. So the takeaway is, if one spouse delays, the other is forced to delay. What if I qualify for multiple benefits? Again, you can't take them all. You got to take the higher of either the two or the three. So here's some claiming tips that I want to uh, impart before we the end, end the session here. The best way to grow your benefits, again, no matter how you slice it, no matter how many different tricks and, and, and tips there are in this world, the best way to grow is to delay your benefits. The second bullet point, remember the magic happens at your full retirement age, at your full retirement age. So a lot of the, uh, the things that I mentioned like spousal benefits or voluntary suspensions, it works best at your full retirement age. 
Number three, if you file before your full retirement age, there's a chance of permanent reduction. There's a chance for a permanent reduction. Number four, remember spousal benefits do not grow. Number five, ask yourself what is more important, a larger benefit, larger monthly benefit, or the largest collection over your lifetime? Because those are two very different strategies. And depending upon how you answer that question, you have to proceed carefully. And lastly, number six, one of the spouses must be collecting benefits for the other spouse to be approved. So here's another tip for you. If you've been married for nine years, 11 months, and 30 days, when you get divorced, neither you nor your spouse will collect a dime, whether it be for spousal benefits or survivor benefits. But if you wait just one more day, just one more, stick it out for one more day and make it the full 10 years, then you will see ex-spousal benefits follow you for the rest of your life. Uh, again, this is assuming that you end up in a separation or in a divorce situation, okay? But if you don't hit that 10 year mark, you will not see ex-spousal benefits, okay? No matter how many times you apply. One of the, uh, the tips I wanted to share uh, regarding this situation for survivor's benefits is that, um, let's just say whether it be the husband or the wife um, who were, let's say, who was the higher wage earner, if they end up delaying their benefits until the age of 70 and they pass away sometime in the future with the highest benefit payout, uh, the survivor or the surviving spouse receives that exact benefit um, or that last stage before the higher earner passed away. Uh, so again, if it's possible, um, you know, I've seen cases where spouses would, uh, would talk this out and have a negotiation, uh, negotiation, <laughs> negotiation, just to have a plan. Let's just say a plan where the higher earner would uh, delay their benefits as, as long as possible so that uh, the survivor gets the, the maximum benefit. For widows and widowers, you can switch benefits. What that means is, let's say that you were um, a widow or a widower at, at an early age. You could actually apply as early as age 60, not 62. Remember how we mentioned 62 is that first window of opportunity, but not for widows and widowers. Uh, it's actually 60. So let's say that you were taking survivor benefits at the age of 60. What you can actually do at that point is you can allow your own benefits to grow from 60 to 70, drop the survivor's benefit at the age of 70 and take your own, which have grown over the course of waiting for 10 years. Okay? So that is what I mean by switching benefits. Okay? That is not the case for both spouses who are still um, alive. You can't switch like this, okay? So again, here's some percentages for you. Uh, if you take your benefits at the age of 60, you'll notice there's a, uh, a reduction, okay? Uh, what is that, 28.5 or so? Uh, if you take it at 62, there's a reduction of 19%. And if you take it, it should be, 66, uh, normally full retirement age. Uh, is There are more 66s than 65s, but in this case, let's just go with 65. Uh, there is another reduction here, okay? So again, if you can wait for your widows or widowers benefits or survivors benefits until your full retirement age, uh, that's where you'll get 100% of the benefits. Now, I don't know if we have any government employees uh, in the audience here today, but if you were to say receive a pension uh, from say, 
a federal, state, or local government, um, you probably didn't pay Social Security taxes, okay, from, from my knowledge. Now, for those who have, uh, it, it's kind of an extra bummer just because of the fact that the moment you start receiving your pension, you will notice that your Social Security benefits actually get reduced. And that's what we call the windfall elimination provision. And if you are in a situation where you're looking for spousal benefits and you're married to, say, for example, a teacher, then your spousal benefits will also be reduced based on the uh, uh, another provision called the government pension offset. Okay. So the trick of the trade is the windfall elimination provision, as well as the government pension offset, actually gets activated when you start receiving your pension amount. So if you're quickly doing some, some uh, let's say, some strategic thinking here, if you delay your pension and you want to just start off by receiving your full Social Security benefits, you can do so without any reduction because the the catalyst is the pension itself. As long as the pension did not kick in, it won't affect your social security. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, again, I understand this doesn't apply to everybody, but that would be one of the tricks of beating the windfall elimination provision as well as the uh, government pension offset. I know there is a bill that is currently out or that was introduced back in 20, as a matter of fact, it might've been last year, uh, where they're in discussions uh, of, of trying to eliminate this provision. Uh, but the last time I checked, which was about 60, 90 days ago, it really hasn't, the, the bill hasn't moved along. Uh, as y'all know, there needs to be uh, sponsorships, there needs to be approvals. And if you know anything about Congress, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it's just really hard to pass a bill these days. If you can delay your pension, it will not affect your social security. This is another table that they use for the work um, to calculate your reduction. So we're going through the final slides here. And I just wanted to let you know that if you receive your social security statement that usually gets mailed out on an annual basis, if you look within the content of this document, it pretty much gives you all the information that you need to plug in, uh, say, the necessary numbers or the data into the calculators on ssa.gov, okay? So the statement is really important. Now, if you are in the camp where you haven't received any of these statements for the past God knows how many years, uh, I know I haven't seen this statement for over five, five six years. What I would do is I would go to ssa.gov forward slash my account. This is a site where you can create your own personal social security account. And it allows you to verify your, uh, your earnings. Uh, remember the 35 years of earnings? It, it allows you to see how close you are. Uh, it also allows you to manage your account in terms of uh, making uh, or setting up direct deposits, I should say, or um, making payments, changing addresses, um, applying for benefits. So it's a really great site to uh, uh, explore. But um, I just wanted to thank everyone for, for sticking, it, sticking it out with me. Uh, but a lot of the cases and concepts and formulas that I shared with you all can be found through publications that you see on my screen right now. Uh, just again, go to ssa.gov, you'll find things like retirement benefits and understanding how it's calculated. Uh, there were a few questions about Medicare and it gives you a very easy to understand language um, of, of how everything works. Um, what I try to do was I try to make uh, some of the convoluted concept Again, easy to swallow. Um, if I did not make that happen again, please feel free to reach out to me. 
uh, I would love to uh, clarify anything that you did not understand. But um, again, if you can have uh, a chance to look at these publications and perhaps maybe uh, sit in on maybe another uh, social security presentation of mine in the future, things will just make perfect sense, okay? Um, another helpful supplement, uh, if you will, is there is a book that I, I just, I adore, uh, if I could use that word, adore. Um, it's by uh, Lawrence Kotlikov, as well as Philip Mulder. Perhaps some of those names, uh, a few of those names might sound familiar. Um, Philip has a, uh, a column in, uh, I believe it's on PBS, uh, if you all are subscribers to it. Uh, he has a great column, uh, always in discussion on social security uh, and Medicare topics, uh, scenarios, and he does a great job of explaining what's going on. And of course, Lawrence, he's, he's been the pioneer of social security uh, tricks and tips. Uh, you know, he's a um, he's an econ professor over at Boston University, and he's been doing this for decades. Um, and a lot of the strategies that he's applied over the decades, I apply uh, for my own clients as well. So if you can get a hold of this book, I highly, highly recommend it. It's called Get What's You Worse. And I believe there's been a few revisions since uh, since it came out. So please take a look. Okay. Um... Well, John, thank you very much today for coming again and sharing all your expertise with you, with us. Um, and a couple things for everyone. Okay, this presentation today uh, is being recorded and it will show under distance learning on Ollie in a week or two. The actual PowerPoint presentation we're going to post on the Ollie website. If you go to the section that shows all the class descriptions and drill down to transitions in retirement essentials, next to this class, you'll see it. Uh, we'll have it later this week and you can just download it or view it. So that will give you, because John covered a lot of detail today and that, so that's available to you. And before we adjourn today, I'm just gonna cover a few classes here that are coming up in the near future. Right here, you'll see some future classes. Uh, we have one next Wednesday, a medical and advances in diagnosis and treatment of BPH. Uh, the next few classes, uh, these are all open to the public. Uh, October 10th, this class on Saturday morning. And uh, the next one is Enriching Social Relationships. We have one of the professors at the university who has spoken many times at Ollie to talk about that. October 17th, we have a buy that week. There's no class on Saturday morning on October 17th. And October 24th, um, we have a class on Medicare Essentials. And uh, that one, the organization that presents at the Council on Aging and um, Orange County, they do one-on-one -on -one counseling with people on helping you choose a Medicare provider. Please remember this, that particular session will not be recorded. So if you really want to see it, you really need to sign on on the 24th. That will not be recorded. Okay, I think we've pretty much covered everything today. Again, another thank you to John for sharing his expertise for us. And uh, as mentioned, we'll be back next Saturday uh, with Enriching Social Relationships at 9.30. Thank you.